have uh, tonight uh, the opportunity to hear about a different collection of narratives about that moment, the student and uh, worker struggles uh, against outsourcing and against fees. Uh, Kelly Gillespie and Leanne Naidu, the editors of this edition of the South Atlantic Quarterly, are here tonight to both introduce uh, the collection and to speak to one of the pieces, well, well, to some of the pieces. The idea that Kelly and I edited this would be actually fake news because you can't edit Ahmed. I mean, you can't <laughs> be an editor in the volume where Ahmed and some of our other colleagues are. So this was, uh, it was a really, uh, it was an attempt um, at a reflection. First to say the, the journal itself, Shibu has a copy of it over there. It's a very interesting volume that deals mostly with Turkey in the, in the main. And then our section is called the Against the Day section. Um, we were wanting to, I'm going to talk mostly around the process of um, trying to write something collectively. Also, because I think for many of us who were on the ground and part of the various forms of um, Fees Must Fall, it was really a process that influenced us not only in terms of ideas, which obviously will be spoken to just now, uh, it also had a serious impact on people, just in general. So there's been a couple of collections by students, there have been a lot of books, uh, monologues, there's even, be, there's even a new genre now of vice chancellors writing about student movements or social movements. So there's been a lot of production. It's not to say there hasn't been, but um, for some of us, it's taken a, a, a little bit of time to think about how one can reflect, analyze, and critique something that you were really intimately involved in, and also something that involved a, a, a huge amount of um, violence, to put it bluntly. And so for me, what was important to do in my piece, what I tried to do was to one, establish the racist foundation of the university outside of neoliberalism, right? To look at the emergence of the South African university in and of itself and what it was meant in terms, what it was meant to do in terms of um, the black subject, right? So the first section I write under is rendering the black subject quiet. And I go back to sort of even pre-apartheid or sort of colonial um, legislation around what to teach the native as a way of disciplining black subjects in the space of education into being subservient citizens, right? Um, and so the project of knowledge production, et cetera, was never one that's intended for the black subject to enter the space of higher education. Also when Professor, is that people Professor? Uh, Adam <laughs> is insistent on the type of violence that comes from the university because of the need to finish the academic program, right? When he says the academic program, that's completely out of time with the type of pedagogic and epistemic issues that students have. So what does it mean to ask for a type of transformation or decolonization in which the very people you're asking it from, right, can't think in that way? So I think for me what's interesting to think about once you acknowledge the racist foundations of the South African University, once you acknowledge the ways in which neoliberalism enhances all these types of mechanisms of regimentation um, and erasure and alienation, what then becomes the possibility in terms of university time to think emancipation? Uh, the political claim is that we cannot ask for what isn't absolutely strictly pragmatically possible for the current moment. <laughs> and so what that's doing is asking us to close down our political imaginations right into the heart of the most, some of the most fascist moments of neoliberal capitalism. <laughs> what students were searching for was precisely um, modes of political claim that went beyond the contemporary moment and that they were also searching for political experimental for political forms so he points to this uh, the moment of assembly in Solomon Matlangu house as such an important um, invigoration of political form in this country um, 
so, so firstly, uh, for people to maybe reflect a little bit on what happened to the, uh, the experimenting, right? Now, obviously, part of it was that the, the space in which the experiment happened in that moment was destroyed in, in a very literal, literal way. Um, but also, the, uh, surely that doesn't mean that all the thinking that came out of it has to have disappeared. And it seems to me that that really, you know, something that's missing from the aftermath of that student movement is the remains of, of an attempt at a radical reimagining, right? The, of, of people who are still somehow trying to reimagine the world and trying to organize around that, right? So, you know, it's, it's one thing to say there was a, a special moment that, that passed or, or more accurately was smashed. Um, but for me, the question then still remains, how do we recreate those moments, right? And if we can't recreate the spaces that we had then, how do we at least keep, um, you know, trying to, to, uh, to force open those spaces? I think that there is a struggle for hegemony here. I think that that corporatization, that trajectory, they were shaken for a while, those in power, and they tried everything. They threw everything at us, including the tens of millions of public funds to get informers. Nobody has talked a lot about this. It's come out in the wash again and again. Uh, the agent provocateurs, etc. Uh, but a simple thing must be done. At the moment, they have carte blanche. Um, all these things are not being challenged. The bigger project, the project of challenging the corporate university, etc. Having free education, by the way, is not an ultra-left or uh, far-left demand. There's, a, there's an important way in which the two-stage theory, right, which was really the dominant Congress theory of revolutionary time in South Africa during the anti-apartheid movement, the two-stage theory which said the first stage of the revolution is going to be the national bourgeois liberation, so black people will take the state. And the second phase of that will be that black workers will insist that that state gets redeployed for purposes of socialism, right? And what we see, of course, when the, when the, the ANC comes to power is that you know, at the moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall, etc., in that national context, that that second phase simply falls away from any kind of national agenda. It's having a momentary re reawakening in national politics, but by and large, that second phase gets, um, uh, gets forgotten. And so what, and, and in its place, becomes a project of assimilation of black people into the existing infrastructure of the state and institutions that were created through the colonial and apartheid project. And we see that students, really, are the driving, become the driving critique of that assimilationist project. Leanne and Kelly around the two-stage phase. I'm wondering, your the attachment to that narrative, ro that romance, um, I mean, it's by 1994, we've had enough examples and enough, a large body of work that tells us that the romance is a romance and that the gesture event of independence and the colonial struggle is simply a symbolic one. So what attach, because it seems to me the attachment to its failure is about a coming to a consciousness. Um, so I'm wondering who's coming to a consciousness, who subject, what subject do you refer to and how does black subjectivity become a route into that awakening in some kind of way? Because it's not surprising to me that things fail. So who is surprised? What, what are the politics of articulation and how do we think about how to articulate a set of demands in this moment in a way that makes what might be illegible legible, which, which, which insists on, on, the, on the brokering of a different kind of legibility? I think it's extremely important um, that we take that as, as part of the project. As much as there were certain things that we were certain about, right? 
things cannot continue in the way that they have been, continue, have, have been going. <laughs> there has to be a break. There has to be a moment of discontinuation. And yet, when that shutdown happened, the possibility for uncertainty emerged. And I think that was one of the most interesting components of the movement, is that we weren't sure quite how to be with each other. We can be together in new ways. And, and I think this is exactly against the arrogance of the academy, <laughs> that you publish for self-aggrandizement, that you publish to leave your mark on history, <laughs> that you publish to assert a kind of egomaniacal academic righteousness, that you publish to correct. But I do think that one thing that we have to acknowledge is that one part of the politics of black subjectivity was to be assimilated. It always has been, okay, um, into the system. And that is about the second stage. And therefore, I, while I agree with the gesture of critique of two stages, I think that we have to acknowledge that even amongst some of the most radical black students who invoke the language of blackness, right? It's because they want to be at the head of the system. They want to be assimilated. Um, and the, in a sense, the politics of identity, and because I think we should call it by that name, not all of it, but some of it, right, is about assimilation. Okay? It speaks a radical language right, and can become part of an anti-systemic politics, but it's not consistently that. The politics of black subjectivity is as heterogeneous as his other politics. And I think we need to disaggregate this politics of blackness. Because when I hear many people speak a kind of radical black language, and I see their actions, and I often kind of follow their politics, I don't see radicalism. I hear radicalism, but I don't see radicalism. Partly with this collection, and this uh, touches on the nice question around uh, who's surprised and what consciousness are we dealing with, and also you know, this question around the second stage and how assimilation is also part of that first stage. Um, in my thinking about it uh, with Kelly and with others, is that what we did see quite often was the way in which what seemed to be older debates were playing out between individuals, sometimes related to various political parties and sometimes actually not. But some of the key questions that come out of those traditions seem to be on the table again in a way that needed some kind of historicizing. Um, and so partly I think the, the deep history work was also to put that down and say, uh, we don't actually know how many people um, recognize how much of the fights now are linked to these four or five major traditions, even as uh, I think it was Taz that asked like what is outside of that and why are we so invested in those traditions. So in a way that's at least our rereading and closer reading of, of the two-stage theory came from that and also came from wanting to try and understand what would have informed uh, the theorizing of revolution of the people currently in power. And we know that their consciousness has shifted in a particular way and I think there's serious work that needs to be done to try and figure out uh, what is a uh, Habib at the head of universities, a Cyril Ramaphosa, <laughs> who had a very serious role to play in Marikana, what, what informs the way that they have changed? <laughs>